Hey, my name is Oresti Chakas and this is my true story. Today we're having Orestes Chakas, a winemaker from, well, as you can imagine, Chakas Winery, right? Hi, Orestes. Hi. The question is actually if uh, we are having him or he's having us because we are the winery now. Uh, yeah, and uh, Orestes is awesome, and uh, today I will be asking him plenty of tricky and stupid questions. Oh, I told you to give you smart questions, but you denied that, so let's see how it's like, gonna go. Yeah, <laughs> so if the questions become smart, you know that it's not me who wrote them. <laughs> Yeah, so Arestes, my first question is, it's a beautiful winery and you guys are doing great things. Who is the boss at the winery now? Oh, wow. <clears throat> uh, so basically, the winery was uh, started with uh, my parents, our parents, and uh, that started in 1988. Now, still, they're here, uh, but they're more like uh, managing the winery or seeing, let's say. Uh, however, now it's the second generation coming in, so you can kind of say that each one of the brothers has a specific section of the winery who's in, kind of in charge. So I'm kind of like in charge of uh, the winemaking, uh, a bit of uh, the exports. My brother is in charge of uh, hospitality and uh, the events that we're doing here, um, along with uh, my sister who is uh, helping him. And uh, my other brother is in charge of uh, the vineyards that okay. we're doing and the quality of the fruit that comes in, basically. Yeah, and uh, well, do you feel like you are a new generation that is modernizing and like, uh, is there a revolution that is prepping? I think, uh, yeah, since um, I came back the past five years, there has been kind of revolution, let's say, from the point of view that we have released at least six different wines since uh, I came back, all with a distinct and different style each one of them. And apart from the winemaking point of view and the wines that we have released, uh, we're also trying to be as more close to the consumer as possible. We have renovated our place here and we're actually doing events here at the winery to show to people that you can actually come here, have a good time, and that um, wine is not something posh and there are good words that you can place to it and that you can actually enjoy it and have a good time with it. It's a social uh, product, which you can have a good time uh, having it together. You always have to have good company with it. Okay, that's a very interesting perspective on uh, wine not being <laughs> <laughs> posh. Okay, uh, so it's like more democratic, social wine, Czechos yes. wine. Okay, uh, that's pretty cool. And it is indeed a very beautiful place. So, Orestes, you're coming from obviously, well, a winemaking family. And my question would be, did you, I mean, I can hardly imagine a kid who wants to work at the winery, right? But were you one? What did you want to do when you were young? And how did it, how did you come to actually, like working with a family business? Well, I hated it. I mean, I kind of loved it and then hated it at the same time. So uh, when I was really young, I wanted to be a basketball player and a detective in US. Well. Don't, I mean, I'm sitting now, but I'm quite tall. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. That was kind of like my dream when I was a kid. Uh, but the thing is that uh, during the harvest, which was during August, September, all my friends were at the beach uh, having a good time. And I was working here for 14, 15 hours a day um, and try to help my family to make the wine. So. There were uh, months that I wouldn't even go to Limassol, where all my friends were, so it was quite um, difficult for me. I, I didn't really appreciate it as much uh, during that time. So that wasn't my, my dream at the beginning. I wasn't looking forward to it. I was kind of like driven to it, uh, but it was only the past 10 years that I've really appreciated it, let's say. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. What age were you when you tried alcohol first? That's a very good question. Um, I don't remember, probably 14, 15. Was it wine? Yeah, it must have been wine. I, I mean, I don't think it would be anything else. I wasn't really an outgoing kid. I was a bit of a nerd when I was uh, really younger. So that's why I do a lot of parties now, because I wasn't doing the parties when I was really young, I guess. <laughs> because you had to work at a winery. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yes. So that's why I would do a lot of parties now. <laughs> okay, okay. It ended up pretty well. Yeah, as exactly. We can so. <laughs> yes. Um, how is the situation with wine in Cyprus generally? 
I mean, do you feel like people drink? I mean, my personal perspective, my observation, I'm coming from Russia and I feel like in Russia we drink more and we drink more wine as well. Really? Um, yeah. Hmm. What do you think about Cyprus? Okay, so it has to be a bit about the history in order to answer this question uh, for winemaking here in Cyprus. What really happened is that during 1980s, 1990s, early 2000s, the wine that we were producing at that time was really, really bad quality. Therefore, uh, people uh, who were, let's say, 30, 40 years old at that time, they didn't really enjoy wine. They would enjoy uh, brandy or whiskey, for example, for example during uh, their dinners or lunch. That's why um, people now, so going moving forward now to 2023, people that they were 30, people that were 40 years old, so now they're 60, um, they don't really drink as much secret wine. Of course they do, but they tend not to drink as much secret wine and they do drink a bit of foreign wine. However, the past 10 years here in Cyprus, we've been making, not just us of course, but other wineries have been making really good quality wine. So people who are being introduced to wine now, they do prefer Cypriot wine. Especially during the economic crisis that we had during COVID, there was a big shift towards the Cypriot products. And that's when this helped for people who are younger to enjoy more Cypriot wine. So you get to see younger people enjoying more wine and more Cypriot wine rather than older people doing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you feel like um, interest in Cypriot wines is growing uh, fast inside Cyprus and outside maybe as well? Absolutely, because we can see that from the tasting area that we have here, which for example during Saturdays we're fully booked all the time. We see it even during the weekdays, we do have both um, uh, Cypriots coming in or at least people that they are living in Cyprus because people who are living in Cyprus are not just Cypriots. Uh, nowadays, <laughs> and um, uh, also abroad. Just yesterday I received an email that we were uh, added to a wine list of the best restaurant in Switzerland, three-star Michelin restaurants with Vampacada and Comandaria. Therefore, the appreciation of Cypriot wine does not go only abroad and only to Cypriot tavernas who are abroad, but goes to actual restaurants that they do appreciate a good wine. Therefore, I think we're doing a pretty good job of getting ourselves back to the wine, world wine map, exactly where we were 5,000 years ago. Ha. Boom. 5,000 years ago? <laughs> yeah. Were you on the list? Were separate wines on the list? Absolutely, of... yeah. Because ah. if you think about it, Comandaria, it's the oldest AOC in the world. It was made famous by the Knights of Templar. And therefore, this AOC, it's the oldest AOC in the world. And Guandaria is considered to be the grandmother of all sweet wines. This didn't happen by chance. You have to explain what AOC is, I think, now. It's, uh, okay, sorry, Appellation Origin Controle, uh, which basically is a designated uh, geographic origin of where a product can be made. A very good example is, like, say, halloumi, or like Parmigiano cheese, can be made in, or champagne, can be made in champagne, and so on or sherry, can be made in Jerez, uh, in Spain. Right. <laughs> and uh, when you go to the restaurant, what wine do you normally order, generally? Generally. So I have to at least get one or two bottles from our winery. And well... For how many people, if I may ask? <laughs> well, <laughs> for... Uh, well, the more the merrier, so I can get more uh, bottles. Uh, but usually for four to six people, we get like two or three bottles easily. Uh, but it should be at least two bottles of, um, of our winery. And the reason is mainly because when you go out, we are quite known, not just the winery, but me as a person. I mean, You're Cyprus. Famous. Mm. <laughs> not famous, but I mean, we do know people, we, we have friends and so on. So if they see me there drinking another wine, they usually sometimes they feel offended. Yeah, because they're like, okay, I'm here supporting you drinking your wine and then you're not drinking your own wine. I mean, it kind of makes sense, but that's why it's very important to always have a good balance. So I try 
to get uh, my wine sometimes. And when I order another wine from the wine list, which this is very important, is I order a wine that is at something that I know. I wouldn't like to experiment with something because you're paying a wine at the wine list usually three times the price, or even in Cyprus especially, four times the price. Therefore, it's a shame to get a wine that is sometimes not a good quality wine, and then you end up paying for that wine four times its price. Mm-hmm. Is that what I mean? So. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's clear. How much wine do you drink? Uh, a lot. Every day? Do you drink every day? I try to avoid it. Um, it depends when we go out and stuff. I mean, I may end up drinking up to a bottle sometimes, which is not good. But yeah, I mean, it can happen. <laughs> I mean, if we're with the friends that they do drink a lot of wine, we can end up easily drinking a bottle of the person. What is, so. your, what is your personal limit for driving and drinking? Uh, okay. Um, it, it, for me, it depends how I feel. But usually I don't drive and drink. If that happens, like I usually... Like zero, zero. Zero, zero, or... Well, if I have like three or four glasses, for me it's okay, because I feel absolutely fine. It happened to me before I was stopped, and uh, yeah. I had... Because I can, if you're getting used to it, you can digest it much better, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not a good way of thinking. So what I've been doing the past few years now, it's when I go out and I know I'm going to drink, I usually take a taxi to go to where I'm going. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's better to end up spending 15 euros or 20 euros to go and come back to make sure that you're completely safe or at least walk because I'm living in the town center. Therefore, for me, it's I usually walk mm -hmm. when I go out. And uh, well, you already told us that you are drinking your own wine when you are going out, right? Mm -hmm. What about wines of your partners? I mean, like, are you drinking well, absolutely, them? Absolutely, yes. Are you yes, drinking yes, them secretly yes, yes. at home when no one can no, see no, it? No, or? absolutely, yeah, yeah. For ex no, I mean, <laughs> it's much, much easier to actually buy wines from Cyprus when I go to a restaurant because for me, it's a restaurant should not just necessarily have chakas. I mean, I understand that, but there are a lot of other secret wines that they, uh, wineries that they make really good wine. Therefore, for me, a restaurant in Cyprus, a hotel, um, wine shop should carry at least 30-40% of their wine list being secret wine. It should be like that? Yeah, it should be like that. That, that would be my truthful opinion. At yeah. least. Because we do have a lot of different wines each winery produces. And yes, you can make a really good wine list from secret uh, wines. Mm -hmm. So why not? Okay. And, uh, well, if you can name some of the wineries that are your favorites, Sure, yeah. I mean, for Other example, than Chakas, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Vlasidis is uh, an amazing uh, winery, in my opinion. Uh, Arieridis, also. Santa Irene, in, uh, now known as Vine Artua. They make amazing uh, wines from Mavro and Xinisteri. Zabartas, also. Kiberunda. These are just uh, Constantino, of course. You named mo mo most of Vafos. the wineries that we have in See? Cyprus. There probably. you go. <laughs> I mean, with all of them, they are quite. Uh, Good friends also, uh, we even hang out sometimes. I think there is nothing more beautiful than that, that actually sitting down and dining with your competitor, let's say, who is actually not a competitor. Uh, okay guys, so, well, we are lucky today because we are having a bonus. Well, first of all, we're having Andreas Chakas with us here. And, thank you for uh, having me. Thank you for having us. Uh, and we have some wine as well, and uh, it's the time for stupid questions. And I promise that it's not Orestes who gave me this question, but it's <laughs> my own. <laughs> okay, the stupid question of today is, what grape variety would you be, if you could be a grape variety? So for me, I would say, of course, it will have to be an indigenous variety. And uh, that variety will be, for myself, Xinisteri. This has to do because of the versatility of the variety, it can be expressed into a lot of different wine styles. And I think it kind of reflects the same on me. I mean, sometimes I can be much more outgoing, much more social, um, understanding and so on, uh, like a regular Xinisteri. Uh, sometimes I can be sweet, like a Comandaria that we do with 100% Xinisteri. Oh, romantic and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but then I can be sharp, like with Zivania. Huh. So, but still at the same time, you get this smokiness coming out, 
um, from the Zivania that we produce because it's uh, barrel aged. Uh, and then you can be, I, can, I mean personally, like an orange wine that we produce since Terry out from, which has much more um, different layers. It has a different expression, it has a potential of aging, and it can be expressed in the depth of time, also at the same time. Um, therefore, that's why I prefer to be, uh, I, I find myself to be quite um, close to Xinisteri, since um, it has a lot of different layers as a variety. Why is it so acidic? Why is it so acidic? Yeah. Um, so this one, for example, because it's a uh, stainless steel tank uh, fermented, so it's the um, one that we release to be much more fresher, so it's the more pleasant and that doesn't necessarily mean food, so it's the most more social one, you can say. So quite refreshing, I would say, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for uh, two refreshing uh, Orestes then. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers to Orestes. Cheers. <laughs> so, yeah. Andreas. Okay, uh, first of all, I'm going to say something about your question. It's not a stupid question, it's an amazing question if you ask me, because uh, if you get to express yourself through a kind of grape and a variety, you have to be very precise on what you what you choose. I 100% uh, agree with Orestes, he's existed because we can see the different things he can do around the winery, um, from handling like the production to going to the cellar, to um, doing something for the events and everything. He's a very versatile character, what is he himself. Now about me, I'd say um, I'm a more of a Promara, like an indigenous variety. And Promara is, is a kind of, it's a variety that was forgotten for many years. Uh, nobody believed in Promara. And uh, eventually Promara uh, showed to be an, a kind of uh, wine that can age very well. It can show all of its strengths after a few years. It has to become, basically, it has to become mature to be able to showcase all the things that it can do. It's a wine that needs uh, food to be paired with. And I'd say myself, I'm not, a, I'm not an easy going guy. I'm not a simple guy. I need, I, I need things around me to be perfect. I need things around me to be uh, based on quality. And that's why I think I'm uh, more of a kind of a Promara wine. Also an amazing thing about Promara in order to create the wine from Promara, you have to cold macerate it for three days. So basically you extract all its flavors from the skin. So it's the same thing about me. I need to, it's, I, I work better if I'm under pressure. If, if I have a lot of free time uh, in my everyday, I'm not the most productive guy, but if I'm under pressure, it's, it's where I excel most of the times. For example, the events we do at the winery, uh, I take uh, a huge part of the events to create them, and on the day of the events, you could see me I'm very stressed sometimes, but that's the moment that I'm more able to find the solutions for anything needed around the winery or at the event or anything else. That's very deep. Thank yeah. you. Thank wow. You. Okay, let me... Uh... Cheers to that, I guess, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Cheers, cheers to that. <laughs> so I guess your um, analysis should be deep also. What? Your analysis should be deep also then. Mine? Yes, yes. You're going to ask me uh, back? Well, now it's our turn now. Oh, what I do you think of the aromas, <laughs> Xenia? Very fruity. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> I'm under pressure Yes, now. exactly. So now we put you on the spot. Okay. <laughs> Pear. Pear. <laughs> what? Apple. Wait. <clears throat> what? Is there, is there any apple? Honey? No? Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. See? <laughs> as we will as get that. it out. We, can, yeah. we will get it out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all of our, I mean, the most important is that the same that goes with our wines, the same goes with the family. It's all about balance and harmony. Each one has its own uh, section in the winery. The same with the wines. So they are all quite balanced, and that's the philosophy behind everything that we do here. The pure harmony. There you go. Deep. Cheers to that. Cheers to that. As simple as that, actually. Yes. <laughs> um, guys, can you tell us a little bit more on how you work together? Obviously, you're different grape varieties, which we figured it out. I mean, like, do you ever argue? Do you... How does it work between you? Okay, so it's, it's a very complex structure in terms of business. Um, the first thing you have to, have to put down is that it's a family business. And when you're a family business, you have to... You, there, is, there is one thing that everyone in the family business has to share and that it's it's the idea that we are all working on the same in the same direction we might be doing different things entirely different things but we're all working into the same direction so 
uh, one of the fundamental things you have to have in the family business in order to go forward is, to, is trust, uh, also love, and also you have to share the same passion. We fight all the time. It's like, uh, it's, it's, it's a never-ending fight for us. But also it's a never-ending love. So you have two things that go all the time together and one contradicts with the other. But I believe that in our winery, in our family business, love is the strongest part that we all share together because we all grew up together. It's like, it's, it's just a few times during lunch and dinner that I don't remember myself eating with Orestes or with Hectoras or with Eleni or with my mom or my dad. We are always sitting together. Anywhere we are around the winery, I know that around one o'clock Orestes or Hectoras or Eleni will call me, hey, come, it's time to eat. Let's have lunch together. It's one of the most important things that keep the family going on and also the business with it. Yeah, yeah. it is beautiful. And, yeah, uh, I think uh, the answer mainly lies to um, the values that we have as a, as a winery. So it's basically family history, terroir and innovation. In this case, that has to do with, uh, um, with how we work together. It's basically family, innovation and history. So when it comes to uh, um, uh, discussing something about the events, about the wines, about how many grapes we're gonna get, and then family comes in, the history, which is the experience in this case, and then the innovation. If someone brings a new idea on the table and we understand and we appreciate it, the rest of, um, let's say, myself, which I have more experience, let's say, than Andreas, on a specific point of view, then I'm going to listen him out and I'm gonna be, okay, let's do that. And the same goes, I think, with Andreas or Hectoras or Meral and so on. Uh, when it uh, reaches a point that it has to do with history, uh, that I have more experience to that, then they will say, okay, we'll do it your way, because that outvalues more, uh, out outweighs more the, um, let's say, innovation or the new idea part coming into the uh, discussion. But both of them, innovation and history, could not be anything without the family. So yeah, that's very important. Is there a person in the family who takes the final decision? Because guys, there are a lot of you, right? And uh, you know, if everyone has their own ideas, I bet that you dislike some others. You know, like what, how does it, is there a one person who says like, we're doing this or like, no way. I mean. um, it depends on which section it's going to lie to. Uh, and uh, we're going to try and go for a vote or uh, someone is going to take it on himself. Like voting, you do this. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's like, yes. But, but uh, <laughs> if, if someone is going to take it up to himself, it's either Costas or that or Orestes. Because it's what, as Orestes said, it's due to the experience and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we trust them. It's, as I told you, it's, it, you have to trust each other. And if I wouldn't trust Orestes about his decision, then... But there's this one funny thing we do during the events because uh, basically we do the events where it's something, where, where if we disagree on something, okay, me and Orestes were like, okay, you have to know, I totally and 100% disagree with you. But if you want to do it your way, let's do it your way. If the end result is going to be good, I'm going to agree with you. If the end result is not going to be good, remember that I totally and 100% 100% disagree with you. And that's what we do. And it works actually. Yeah, of course, because yeah. the person is taking responsibility yeah. and then yeah, 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 yeah. But it's okay. nice, it's nice. Yeah. What is the dream of Chaka's family? How do you see your business guys in five or ten years from now? Is there something that you are like all thinking about? From my point of view, is we want the brand to be recognizable not just in Cyprus but also abroad. That would be the total um, dream regarding the brand. Regarding um, the um, consumer, which, as I mentioned earlier with the events and everything, we're trying to be as close as possible to them. One part and mission of, um, of the winery is to try and educate the consumer about the good winemaking and good wines that now Cyprus is producing. We're trying to be as close to them. This way, um, we're um, trying to help them understand the good wine so they can easily make their own choice, not be directed to it. It's mm -hmm. quite important in my opinion. All so right. want to make the brands quite known and want to be as close as to the um, and, consumer. And uh, talking about geographies, what would be the next geography after Cyprus that you guys are targeting? We are targeting, uh, we're doing pretty well in uh, the US. Um, that would be quite, um, it is quite ideal and uh, we're getting better and better at every year 
um, in uh, that market. But it's again, it's it's not a, a market that you want to dominate or you know want to sell. Uh, we don't want to increase the volume. This is what we want to make everyone understand. It's not about volume, but it's about prestige selling to other wineries. Mm -hmm. Because when you go to sell the wine here in Cyprus and you go to restaurant tavern, they say, yeah, but I'm, I want this, it's, it's not a good. But at the same time, our sinister is being sold to a three-star Michelin restaurant by a glass. Then I don't, I don't feel bad that he's telling me that he doesn't want to add my wine on his wine list. I mean, seriously, I have this. It's not the award in a competition or anything. It's, it's about appreciation of these small restaurants that they actually really value the quality that you're doing and they want something different, something unique that they want to add it to their wine list. Mm -hmm. For us, that's the brand recognition. There is this thing about this, uh, uh, the thing about brand recognition or is this talking about the pro, there is this thing, this quote in the Bible that says, if you want to become a prophet in your own land, you have to become a prophet somewhere else first and then you become a prophet in your own land. So this goes for the wines as well. Sometimes we're not appreciated here in Cyprus, we're appreciated first in abroad, and then be sure that if some people from Cyprus can travel abroad and see that Chaka's wines are doing so well abroad, then they're going to appreciate them even more in Cyprus. Um, I, think, I think that in order to change that, you need a few, a few very stubborn and passionate people that they actually love their homeland, like for, for example, for us, Cyprus. And if you have the passion and love for your, for your own country, then you can eventually show to other people that this place is a very special place as well. So Orestes, can you give the winemakers some advice, the ones that are starting, venturing into it now? One of the, um, the most important advice would be always to start small. Whatever you do, you should start uh, with a small production and always test the market. The price is quite sensitive in wine and you should never exaggerate on how much your wine is really worth. And if you really don't know what you're doing, please hire a consultant. I mean, they're gonna help you. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna have that consultant for the rest. They're gonna guide you through and uh, they can help you to better understand, know where to focus in order to make a better wine in the end. And don't forget, I always keep on saying this, making wine is like the same as being a chef, but we only get to cook once a year. There are no redos. So it's quite important that um, if you only have one chance, for me, for example, I'm going to only cook how many? 30 times in my life? More? Well, it depends. Yes, yes, of course. When are you going I mean, to retire? <laughs> yes, yes. But uh, the whole point is that it's not like you're going to make a dish and then you're going to throw it away and then redo it again at the same time. You cannot do that. You have to wait for the next year so that your vineyard is going to be ready. So it's better you have the knowledge. If you don't get the knowledge, the knowledge can be bought. Thank you. And uh, well, imagine that I want to become a winemaker. What do I need? Do I need a land? Do I need how much money do I need? Okay. What kind of education should I get? Um, Okay, the education, you have to be a winemaker. You have to study in enology and viticulture. Where? Um, you can do that in uh, Greece. Uh, there are some open universities here in Cyprus that are actually teaching, so you can get the basis. And it doesn't mean that um, you're going to study Cyprus, it's a lower quality. No, it's not. It's, it, it's, it has to do with you. You have to be outgoing. You have to go to other tastings. You have to know what other producers are doing. You have to speak with the consumers so they can give you the feedback and actually understand the trends. You have to understand the trends worldwide, globally, what's really going on in order to know what you're going to do. A wine that you're actually producing yourself and you like it, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to sell because it's the taste buds of thousands and thousands of people that are going to actually approve it, not just you. You have to think both yourself and how the consumer is going to perceive it. So that's quite important. Uh, in order to start a winemaking business, all you need is maybe you can source some grapes. Don't buy your own land and plants at the beginning. You can source some grapes, do something that you have someone that is quite truthful, that you can trust, get the grapes from them. You can oversee, let's say, the uh, vineyard um, uh, season. So you can get a good uh, quality fruit, start producing your uh, wine, 
and then make sure that you're going to release it and be always truthful. Sounds like this like a uh, home village wine, you know? <laughs> can I produce it in my own apartment, I guess? Well, I mean, not in your own <laughs> apartment, but I mean, you can get it like a small tanks and uh, you can actually do it even uh, with your hands. But there are a few things that you need to make sure that you're going to end up with uh, at least a decent quality and that would be um, the amount that you're going to get so that all the tanks are quite full and the temperature that you're going to ferment the wine in. Apart from that, it's you can do even not your apartment, but at least <laughs> somewhere in around Trodos. All right. So, well, we are at this beautiful winery, the Chakas Winery, right? And um, Arestis, what is that? Uh, bottles uh, waiting to be bottled, empty ones. When are we going to bottle those? Uh, next week. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Arestis, can you show us a little bit of the winery, maybe? Sure. Yeah. We can uh, go inside. Have a look at um, the museum. Basically, and, uh, well, we have a small section that um, we have where we explain to people how we used to, um, they used to make wine here in Cyprus and then inside in the wine cellar. Well, let's uh, have a look at the cellar. Ah, oh, nice. It smells very good, huh? Yeah. So this is basically our uh, oak barrel room. Uh, as a wine professional, if I give you, well, if someone gives you a glass of wine, can you say in what kind of barrel was it? If it's 100% French and it's 100% uh, American, you can probably do that. But if it's a blend of them, uh, it's quite difficult. Unless the oak it's brand new and therefore it gives a lot of influence to the wine, so it's more evident into the aromas. You mentioned that it can be from different oak. How does it work? Like one barrel can be made from different oaks? Or wine... Different even... forests. Uh. So the forest has a lot to do with the actual um, flavors that you might get into the wine in the end. And I also know that um, barrels are pretty expensive. Yeah. Look at this room. How many barrels do you have? We have uh, at this moment 140 barrels. Okay. How much is it? In 1, euro, thousand euros per barrel, give or take uh, one hundred fifty euros. Mm -hmm. Okay. Average price. Yeah. And how often do you have to change them? Up to we usually keep them for five years, and then we have to buy new ones. So five usages. Can work in um, the cellar. <laughs> so we lay down all the the bottles. So yeah, all the bottles are full before. Um, you ask uh, if they're that, empty. Yeah, yeah, if they're empty, because I do get that uh, a lot. So yes. All right, and um, well, I see they are stored horizontally, which I know why. <laughs> but <laughs> what about the corks? I mean, like, what kind of corks do you guys use? Are they natural corks? Or? So we're using uh, kind of like a synthetic cork in a way, which is still natural cork, but it's kind of like processed. So basically, it's still an natural cork, but it's uh, broken down into powder. And then uh, it's basically, uh, they're using uh, supernatural CO2 that goes through it to make sure that there is no uh, TCA particles present there. TCA? Which basically causes the uh, corked wine that we say yeah. a few times, which smells like uh, malt into the bottle. Yeah, TCA is this bacteria or something. Yeah, that causes this yeah. aroma. So basically this makes sure that it doesn't have anything and then they basically put it back together, the cork, and then uh, when they put it back basically this way it makes, it makes sure that the wine can age quite beautifully um, in time. Is it, so in France, yeah. in this like super expensive wines when they're making, what kind mm -hmm. of cork do they use? Well, depends. Now uh, actually I've, I, I do know that uh, they switch to this type of cork, most, most of the wineries they do. Mm -hmm. So they, they do have around 25% of the share of the market, the global market. Okay. So yeah. Oh, okay. I wanted to catch you up on like cutting the costs, but I could not. Okay. Anyhow, uh, pff, what is that, Arrestes? <laughs> so basically this is uh, the first painting that we had here at the, at the winery. It, uh, of course, was drawn by an artist uh, uh, from uh, Nicosia. Uh, so this painting goes back to 1992. It was uh, painted here uh, in our cellar and it basically depicts the god of wine, Dionysus, um, having guy. one of his feasts and having a party I guess so. 
All right, and an yeah. orgy, obviously. Probably, I guess, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Orestes, for, for inviting coming. us. It was quite interesting. So. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Nice seeing you. Yeah, love to see you. Enjoy. Where was the fly? <laughs>